This is Duke University. My name is Erin Worsham. I am the executive director of CASE, Fuqua's Center for the Advancement of Social Entrepreneurship. And I have the honor of introducing our morning keynote. And I am very well aware that you are not here to hear me speak, that you're waiting anxiously for Seth. So I'm going to keep this relatively brief. Um, but, but in brief, part of our mission here at Fuqua is to prepare leaders of consequence. So through our work at CASE, with our partner EDGE, Fuqua Center on Energy Development and the Global Environment, and our amazing Net Impact Club that's hosting you today. We ensure that our MBA students and the organizations that we work with have the business skills needed to create lasting, positive, social, and environmental impact. The power of business to be a tool for creating change is something that we believe very strongly in here at Fuqua and that is clearly embodied by the work of Honest Tea. The story of an enterprising MBA student and one of his MBA professors seeing a market opportunity to provide healthy, less sweet, tasty beverages, but wanting to do that in a mission-driven way, wanting to create healthy and honest relationships with customers, with suppliers, and with the environment. Honest Tea's success has been extraordinary, and we're very lucky to have Seth Goldman here today to talk about his journey of founding and growing this amazing company. Seth Goldman is the president and TEO of Honest Tea. What started with five thermoses of tea being brewed in Seth's garage is now the nation's top-selling organic bottled tea company and is carried in more than 100,000 100, outlets. In March 2011, Honest Tea was acquired by the Coca-Cola Company, helping to further the reach and impact of Honest Tea's mission. The company continues to deep its relationship, deepen its relationship with fair trade certified suppliers in India, in China, in South Africa, and was recently ranked by the Huffington Post as one of the leading eight revolutionary, socially responsible companies. Seth serves on the boards of a variety of organizations, including uh, the National Net Impact Organization, uh, as well as the Yale School of Management and many others. In September 2013, Seth and his co-founder, Barry Nailbuff, celebrated the release of their book, Mission in a Bottle, The Honest Guide to Doing Business differently and succeeding. For those of you that have not gotten a copy of the book, I, I strongly recommend it. It's a fantastic read and provides many uh, wonderful practical pieces of advice about starting and scaling a mission-driven business. And uh, it's likely that every student that's in this audience that reads that book will now start asking us to have all of their textbooks in comic book form, <laughs> which is amazing. <laughs> so again, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Seth Goldman to the stage. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. You know, I've never been to Duke before, but I have to say this really feels like a homecoming between having uh, old friends here, um, relatives here, uh, new colleagues. It's, it's really great to be here. And I want to congratulate you all for being in this room, for being part of this conversation. Um, you may have heard it said, oh, this is one thing, I, I, I don't want to offend any law students who may be here, but um, sometimes I say that um, people who go to law school come in as butterflies. They, they have the idea of being involved in environmental law, and they go out as caterpillars. They sort of <laughs> come and say, oh, well, now you know, I've got to end up in a corporate organization helping you know, corporations sort of find their way around environmental laws. And I think at um, business school, some of you may come in as butterflies and leave as butterflies, but some of you may come in as caterpillars thinking you want to just be in the business world, and all of a sudden be awakened to the idea that business can be this powerful driver of change, of making our society better. And so um, I hope by being in this room, by being part of this conversation, you'll be uh, awakened to the, to the impact that business can have and, and the idea that you can, your career can be uh, a cause you believe in and, and live every day as, as, as Greg Dees did and so many other people in this room have, have done. So I want to share with you 
a bit about um, the Honest Tea Adventure. I want to take you through um, <laughs> what we've been doing and, and where we're going. Um, but I also want to help give you a sense of, of where I'm coming from. So actually, literally, Honest Tea is based in Bethesda, Maryland, which is just north of Washington, DC. And um, as you probably might guess, over the past uh, few months, Washington, DC has been a weird place to be. We had the government shut down. We had a bunch of other sort of strange events. And it was um, a little dysfunctional. And, and uh, when the government was shut down, a lot of people were just getting discouraged. Like, is there anything positive coming out of there? And I want to share with you the one positive scene, at least in my view, uh, of what something that happened in Washington. Just when the government shut down, President Obama signed a, um, an order making sure the military was going to get paid during the, the, uh, the furlough. And so they had a picture of him um, signing the bill. And it turns out that on the, the Resolute desk, you had a bottle of honest tea. Yeah. Now, somebody pointed out, well, you know, the tea wasn't facing forward. You could have photoshopped that in, but I um, wouldn't have been honest to do that. Uh, but actually, it's kind of interesting, because think about when was the last time you saw a president with a brand? You know, they're pretty meticulous, and their handlers are pretty meticulous about not letting them sort of you know, be endorsers. And yet, um, that happened. And, and uh, my, as my wife pointed out, there's no coaster on the desk. We should have sent him some coasters. But <laughs> um, so anyway, that's kind of an interesting uh, little, little um, element. And that, for me, was a, a positive outcome, although, of course, I would have preferred the government hadn't shut down. Um, so anyway, we're from Washington, DC. But as you heard, we buy tea leaves from all around the world. And I want to take you through two, what we'll call origin stories, two connections to origin. We always try to stay connected to, to where our product comes from. And I'm going to share with you just two insights that I've gained from some of our suppliers. So the first is from a trip I took to China a few years ago. Um, China is the world's largest exporter of tea, largest producer of tea leaves. And uh, we get all of our green tea from China. Our top seller, honey green tea, is made with green tea from China. And so I like to get to the gardens to reconnect with the communities that supply us with the source and just understand their view of the world. So I had flown a long way, driven a long way, flown again and driven again, and ended up in Anhui province. And, and you see, we got out of the, the car. And I was, at that point, fairly impatient to see tea bushes because of so much travel. And yet, when my host brought me out, I saw some houses. I saw a river. I didn't see any tea bushes. And I said, well, we are here to see tea bushes, right? And he said, oh, yeah, I know. It's, it's just on the other side of the river. So naturally, I look for the bridge. Is there, how, do we, how are we going to get the, to the tea bushes? And I, I don't see any, any bridge. And um, I wonder if I'm in one of those Zen parables where you know, you've already been with the tea leaves in your mind. But <laughs> and so um, I asked them, I said, well, have you, have you thought about building a bridge? I mean, you know, when you're in commerce, you need to be able to bring your product to market. Um, and they gave me four interesting reasons why they didn't. So first, they said, look, we're, we're a poor province. We can't just put up a bridge just because that you know, might be economically expedient. Number two, there's a lot of flooding in this part of China. And, and at one point of the year, it may be underwater, the bridge, or it may be far from land. Number three, it's an organic tea garden. So there's no need for, for you know, large equipment or you know, heavy bags of chemicals to bring over. But the most interesting thing they said was, if we build a bridge, then there'll be a road. And if we build a road, then there'll be infrastructure, and with that will become pollution. And we're trying to protect our source. So instead of a bridge, this guy comes up in a bamboo raft. And we got our feet a little bit wet. It was a little shaky. I felt the need to, to crash. <laughs> but we ended up in the tea garden. And for me, it was a really interesting insight, because I saw a pro uh, what I thought was a problem. I saw no bridge, and I said, that's a problem. But for this community, no bridge was a solution. How, in a, in a country like China, where there's so much development, how do you protect your source? And for them, that problem was the solution. And we can take the, let me just beat this metaphor into the ground a little bit now. So you look at agriculture, right? We see weeds, we see pests in a field. We have a solution, chemical pesticides, chemical toxins that will kill those things. But as we now know, those, so those, those solutions are that create other problems. We see business as a creator of a lot of the problems in our society. But could that problem also be a solution? So that's one way to think about uh, things a little differently. I want to take you now to um, India. And we source all of our black tea from India. We also source a wonderful ingredient called Tulsi. Has anyone heard of Tulsi? Uh, it's, a, it's a basil leaf that we, we use as an, an herbal tea. And I'm going to show you two diff very different um, connections, two different suppliers. So the first is a fair trade tea garden, really one of the leading, fair, I think the first fair trade, fair trade tea garden in the world. 
It's in southern India. Uh, um, and so in this community, you'll see that the, the school that we're supporting with fair trade funds really is a world-class school in rural India. It's, it's, it sounds sort of hard to believe, but you'll see um, what we've been able to support there. And then the second community is a, a much more basic, um, so, so Tulsi is, is a basil leaf. It's just a ground plant, uh, a, shade, a shade crop. Um, and you'll see the economic needs of this community are, are much more basic. They only have access to power um, for 90 minutes a day. And um, as it turns out, when we're visiting there, um, the power comes on and it changes what happens in the trip. Um, but you'll also see uh, how we, well, one of the things we've done to help this community um, develop. And so if we can roll the video for India. At Honest Tea, we always like to stay connected to our ingredients and the communities that produce them. Too. So these are the tea bushes. Whoops. <laughs> I can narrate if we don't have sound. At Honest Tea, we always like to stay connected to our ingredients and the communities that produce so them. So this is about so uh, 6,000 feet above sea level. So earlier this year, I traveled to Tamil Nadu in India you can see to visit the core of the tea, tea garden, 6,400 feet above sea level. <laughs> Here's the two leaves, one, two, and the bud. Her basket is much more full than mine. Once the tea leaves have been picked, they're weighed and then shipped off to the processing center. Two thirds of the land is still rainforest, which helps explain why there's so much biodiversity. The landscapes in Korakunda are amazing, but the most cherished asset in the community is the school that's supported by fair trade funds. In fact, the school is so impressive that families from surrounding communities try to get their children into the school, even if the parents don't work in the tea garden. We were warmly welcomed and even treated to a local version of the Hokey Pokey. Just for fun, I brought along Stomp Rockets, a toy my sons and I have always enjoyed, and we even managed to get one stuck on the roof. We also visited Bengaluru to learn more about the Tulsi plant. The first farm we visited was four acres owned by a farmer and his wife. The power only comes on for three hours a day in Bengaluru, and it just so happened that when we were there, the power came on. So when the water pump started, it was time to plant the Tulsi seedlings. It took a few tries to learn how to plant the seedlings the right way. Cows roam freely in India, so you have to watch your step. Tulsi is also known as holy basil, and the herb is used in Hindu ceremonies, as seen here with this Tulsi garland. During the visit, our supplier and I cut the ribbon on a new Tulsi drying facility. The farmers can sell freshly picked Tulsi for about 14 cents a kilo, not that much. When they sell it as garlands, they can sell it for 36 cents a kilo. But when they can sell Tulsi as a dried ingredient, they can sell it for $3.70 a kilo. The new drying shed allows the community to capture more than 20 times the value of freshly picked Tulsi. I also met with several dozen local farmers and explained why organics is important to American consumers and a great market for them. The opportunity to meet these farmers and learn more about the spiritual role Tulsi plays in their lives made me even more excited to share this wondrous plant with our consumers. So a nice postscript to this story is that um, just uh, this past fall, I, um, the, our, the, the head of the co-op came to, to uh, Baltimore. We were having a, the Natural Product Expo there. And he told me that the community, when I visited, their capacity was 10,000 kilos. Um, but because of the drying hut, because what I would say was a sales pitch for me about how we're investing in this crop, their, their um, capacity expanded to 100,000 kilos. So really exciting growth. And then on the, on the demand side, just um, a few months ago, Honest Tea announced a national partnership with a chain called Smashburger, it's a national restaurant chain, um, that were selling fresh brewed tea. And one of the varieties Smashburger is offering is our lemon herbal tea, which is made with Tulsi. So we've both grown the supply and growing the demand as well. Um, and I, I will share with you, because I stayed last night at the Dave Thomas Center, that we're actually in the middle of a, a, a test with Wendy's, um, which is also testing our lemon herbal tea. So we're going to need a lot more drying huts if we're able to close that deal. 
Um, OK, so I was actually sitting where you were sitting, not uh, physically, but, but psychologically, 20 years ago. <laughs> I was over at the Yale School of Management. And if you had told me 20 years ago that I'd be running an organization that was involved in helping to eliminate billions of calories from the American diet, that was involved in promoting uh, more sustainable agriculture, that was um, going to be promoting fair trade labor standards in the developing world, I would have said, oh, that sounds like a great nonprofit or, or a great government entity. You know, what's the name of it? I never would have guessed that it could actually be a, a beverage company, let alone one that's now owned by the Coca-Cola company, let alone one that delivered a 26-fold return to its original investors. Uh, but that's been the adventure for Honesty that I've been on, and I'm going to share with you how that came to be. So as I said, it started in the classroom. This is a, uh, an excerpt from the book. It is a comic book. Um, you know, we don't do anything just, it's not business as usual, so it's not business book as usual. And um, I was a student in my uh, Professor Barry's classroom. Barry's up there, that's, that's me. And so if there's nothing else, make sure you <laughs> listen to your professors and don't be afraid to challenge them when you have a good idea. That's how Barry and I got along. And we were having a discussion about the beverage business. And um, there was a case study, actually, uh, Coke versus Pepsi, looking at the cola wars. And Barry said, well, there's, there's so much competition. Is there anything missing? And at the time, I said, yeah, there's sweetness levels. There's all kinds of different, you know, as we all know, you walk through a beverage aisle, there's you know, different packages, different colors, different names. But at least in uh, 1995, all the drinks had basically the same calorie profile. They almost all had the same ingredient profile, too. Why didn't, so I said, well, when I make tea at home, I don't put 10 teaspoons of, or six teaspoons of sugar per serving, but maybe half or one teaspoon. Why isn't anyone doing this? And Barry agreed and was ready to, he said, let's do focus groups and I, let's make some product. I said, I, I gotta find a job. <laughs> <laughs> so I, as much as it's a fun idea, I'm not gonna pursue it right now, but I certainly kept the idea in my mind. I came down to Bethesda, Maryland, where I worked for the Calvert Funds for two and a half years. And then after a run in Central Park, after presenting to some institutional investors, I said, you know, this idea is still out there. I think I'm ready to do something about it. And I got back in touch with Barry. And Barry had just come back from India. This was in uh, 1997 now. And, and not only had um, he sort of been thinking about the idea too, but he had just come up with the name Honest Tea, which for me kind of like, you know, all of a sudden the clouds parted. Now I understood why this, you know, how this could work. And so we registered the name Honest Tea, and it's, it's kind of funny, we registered two different ways. We, we registered it, you know, Honest Tea, just as, as you see it, but we also registered H-O-N-E-S-T-E-A. And within a few weeks of doing that, we heard back from Nestea's trademark attorney who said, um, you know, you're trying to market a product called Ho Nestea. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and we're not comfortable with that. I said, well, well, when you put it that way, I don't think we're comfortable with that either. <laughs> we're we're going to withdraw the, the application for Honest Tea. And um, if, if you let us keep Honest Tea, and so that was how we got the rights to the name. And so uh, we brewed five thermoses of tea. It was actually in my kitchen, not my garage, just for anyone worried about sanitation. Uh, <laughs> and then brought it to Whole Foods. We had a label that we had pasted on uh, an empty Snapple bottle. And, brought it to the buyer and said, we want to sell this in your stores. And to my great delight and horror, the, the buyer said, well, we'll take 15,000 bottles. <laughs> and so then we had the challenge of figuring out how to make it. And I'll share with you a little bit more how we did it. But we did manage to deliver the product uh, and have been innovating from there. Now, because we're in a business school, I want to share with you a little bit of the theory. And this is an actual label. And I'm, I'm willing to bet we're the only beverage company that's put a um, marginal utility curve on our um, label. So uh, it doesn't take an econ PhD to brew tea, but Barry has one, and sometimes it actually helps. Here's how. Sugar, like most goods, has a declining marginal utility. One teaspoon takes away the tea's bitterness. Another adds a nice sweetness. That's where we stop. More sugar adds calories, but not much more taste. And by the time you've got six teaspoons per serving, it's liquid candy. So here was our tea. And you'll notice it's not at the absolute peak of the um, taste curve. It's just to the left of it, but you can reach, you can get there with a lot less sugar. Um, so that was our point. Uh, so at least for MBAs, they can sort of <laughs> apply, <laughs> apply that thinking. Um, other ones, people just kind of got a chuckle out of it. Um, so that's the main idea, just a little bit less sugar. You still can have great taste, but obviously a lot fewer calories. And, and we save money on sweetener as well. Um, so what happened was we got to the market. We started doing really well in the natural food stores. We did tons of sampling. And what we found is that 
for the consumers who were looking for us, we were it. This was an example of an email we got from, uh, this was actually a voicemail we got from one of our consumers, and she said, I went to your website last night, I thought, oh my gosh, I would beg to work at this company, I would move so I could work for your company, how responsible are you, that is just so everything, I wish you did everything, I wish you did my banking, I wish you were my neighbors, thank you so much, I love this product, I drink it every day. So, like, that's not, that's not normal, that's not natural, right? <laughs> but, that was the kind of excitement we were, we were breeding. And we had this guy in California, he had an actual honest tea tattoo. Um, so that's a customer for life. And so, um, so people got it. They really were, and so that was exciting. And yet we were really only in the natural food stores. And we knew if we were gonna really grow, we needed to get beyond the natural food stores. And, and this will set up an important theme, which is um, we never built this company to sell healthy food to healthy people. I mean, we want to do that. That's the core of our business. But if we're really going to succeed, we have to be able to sell healthy food to people who are trying to get to be healthy. And so what happened was we went, I went, to all the kind of distributors we needed to get to, to to build a brand who could get us not just to Whole Foods, who we love, and the natural food co-ops, who we love, but to get us to the convenience stores, to the delis. And so um, that was where the business got much more challenging. I went to the folks who distributed Snapple and Arizona and Nantucket Nectars, and we got um, you know, 135 different flavors of rejection. So you know, they would say it's not sweet enough, or they would say it's too expensive, or it tastes like grass, or uh, um, the label wasn't flashy. The, the, the classic sort of, this is one of these, it's hard to believe except it really happened. One distributor, the one in New England who I really needed said, well, we can't carry your product because your product um, doesn't come in a, in a 24 bottle case, and we need to make uh, we need to make five dollars a case. Um, I said, "Well, wait a minute. Now, our product, you know, we're, we're 12 bottles, but you make three dollars and fifty cents a case. Um, so, so actually, if you're selling 24 bottle, if you know, two cases, you're making seven dollars." Says, "No, no, but we need to make five dollars a case." <laughs> 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 and so, so Barry's like, can I flunk this guy? I said, I said you can flunk him, but he's still not going to carry our product. Uh, <laughs> so it was one of those interesting, yeah, it seems so obvious. And yet, you know, there was sort of a, a business model that we didn't fit exactly into. Um, so, so we were faced with a challenge, right? We're either going to, we were told no by these guys, and we're either going to have to um, just keep asking and hope they change their mind, or we're going to have to work around them. And so that was what we did. We, we developed our own network of distribution. It wasn't beverage distributors. It was what we called our C distributors. And I wish C was the description of their quality. It was more like a D minus network. But it just so happened <laughs> that all of their, the names started with C. So I went to the gourmet stores in, uh, around Bethesda. And I said, you got to carry this product because it's, you know, it's all natural. It's quality. It's artisanal. And, and, and they said, well, why don't, and I was initially, actually, we had two MBA students and me who were making the deliveries, and I would drive up in my Saturn station wagon, and they said, well, we're this gourmet shop. It doesn't really look good when you got, you know, you coming in with your, out of your, bringing us product out of your Saturn. Um, why don't um, you talk to our cheese distributor? And sure enough, we got a cheese distributor who went to the gourmet store and started going to other stores, too. And then I went to Bethesda Bagels, which is a great um, deli in, in downtown Bethesda, he said, well, we don't work with the cheese distributor, but we'd be happy to put you in touch with our corned beef distributor. Sure enough, <laughs> we got going with corned beef distributors. And then I went to the, the grocery stores around the independent grocery stores, and they said, we don't work with these guys, but we'd be happy to put you in touch with our charcoal distributor. And sure enough, we, <laughs> we started to get some distribution. And what happened was we were getting on the shelf, and we were taking away shelf space from beverage distributors. And then they started returning our calls, because he's like, hey, this guy's either going to take our shelf space, or we can start working with them, and we did start to get some of the beverage distributors, which was good, um, but it, I want to, <laughs> these are tough folks to deal with. I mean, being a beverage distributor, so beverages, unlike um, like a cereal, if you go to a grocery store, if, if Raisin Bran sells out, um, you know, that shelf is still going to hold, they're going to hold it for Raisin Bran. But in a deli, if Honest Tea sells out, um, whoever is, can get that shelf space will take it. You know, it's open space, it's not planogram. So beverage distributors, by definition, especially the independents, are very territorial. They, um, they fight for space, and so that mindset carries over into how they act as well. So uh, um, I, I was trying to think about how do I illustrate the, the, uh, 
the dynamic of working with beverage distributors. And, and um, I'm going to apologize in advance for the coarseness of this, but I'm going to play a voicemail that one of my um, sales reps received from one of our distributors in New York. And um, it'll just give you a feel for, for that dynamic. Yo, Mike, this is Louie from Twisted Distributors. Look, all the things that you f***ed up, if you handle that f***ing that works for you, bro, you can take your f***ing RSD and you can stick it up there and have it on f***ing things. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, f*** you, f*** your RSD. You get the point. So, <laughs> uh, so, um... You know, I think it's very easy in, an odd, in, a, in, a, in a group, in a meeting like this, to idealize the virtuous supply chain, right? You start with the fair trade tea garden, you go through the natural foods distributor, you end up in the natural foods store, and uh, everyone's singing kumbaya all the way. But the fact is, if we're going to get beyond that natural foods world, we need somebody like Louie, uh, who may not be inspired by the fair trade um, school in India to be our partner. He, the business needs to work for him as a business proposition, not just uh, as a do good for the world. And, and what's ironic and actually very positive is Louis is still one of our top distributors. Uh, <laughs> and he's still making money on Honest Tea. He actually, he actually became an equity investor when we were growing at one point. So he's done very well by Honest Tea. And, and while I may not share all of his um, mindset or vocabulary, uh, I'm, still, I'm still dependent on him to grow the business. I think that's a really important lesson uh, to keep in mind as we sort of think about um, creating market-driven uh, vehicles that can change uh, the world. So anyway, we started getting in with these beverage distributors. And um, we now are getting national opportunities. We were uh, approached by Safeway, who said, we like your product. We see how well it's selling in natural foods. We want to get it to more stores. We want to carry it in all of our stores. Um, and I'd say, oh, that's really exciting. And they'd say, well, OK, how are you going to do that? I said, well, I've got distribution in the Mid-Atlantic. I can cover Safeway there. I can cover uh, Safeway out on the West Coast. And they said, well, what about Dominic's? What about Randall's Tom? You know, Dominic's in Chicago. What about Randall's Tom Thumb in, in Texas? And we didn't have distribution to cover that. And we realized that we were at a, a crossroads where either we're going to be able to take on um, national distribution and capture those opportunities, or we're going to have to pass on them. And so we recognized we needed uh, a partner who could help us take the brand to the next level. And we were um, approached by a lot of different um, international food and beverage companies because they saw our growth, they saw the opportunity, and we ultimately decided to partner with Coca-Cola. And I'm going to explain to you why <coughs> that made sense to us. First, here's a slide. This is a slide that the Coca-Cola company um, shared with its board in making the recommendation to invest in honesty. And you'll see a lot of themes here that I'm sure will resonate. So back in 2007, there were great uh, mega trends, not just the fads. You know, we're not talking about low carb diets. What are the directions society is headed? And so there was a movement towards health and wellness, a movement towards environmental consciousness, and a, and a movement towards social responsibility. And that little white triangle, that little area where they overlap, is sort of the call it the <laughs> we'll call it the sweet spot. We'll call it just a tad sweet spot. It's uh, it's where um, you try to make a business, create a business that harmonizes all those elements, not perfectly, but at least is thinking about it. And the recognition was that five years out, or six years out, or seven years out, that the standard for doing business will be that every business, or the, or the, the, the businesses that are really connecting with future opportunities are, are, are making decisions that take into account all of those factors at the same time. And Coca-Cola said to, the management said to the board, that's where honesty is, that's what we want to invest in. And so for us, we knew we needed the national um, <coughs> distribution reach, the scale that Coca-Cola could bring. And so it was a very exciting partnership. They invested uh, about 40% of the company in 2008, and as you heard later, and ended up buying the rest of the company. But let's not be naive, right? Here's this mission-driven, organic, fair trade company that I started out of my house. So inevitably, it's going to raise questions when we partner with a large multinational. And that's when we get into what we'll call our shades of gray. It's <laughs> not, not, not just a book that uh, you read on airplanes. Um, so, so what does that mean? Well, when I was growing up in, um, in the Boston in the 1970s, my parents were uh, professors. My dad specialized in, in Russia. My mom specialized in China. So the Cold War was kind of the dinner conversation. And, 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 and in that time, there was sort of a clear-cut world. You had capitalists and you had communists. You had sort of what you thought were the good guys and the bad guys. And you had made in the USA, which everyone agreed was a good thing, you know, versus at the time, made in Japan was sort of had a negative connotation. But what do we have today? Today, you have a car, or I have a car, made in the USA by a Japanese company with parts assembled in Mexico. <laughs> Was that a good thing? Well, it's just a great thing. 
Uh, you have locally grown organic, which I think we can all agree is, is a positive thing we want to support. I know there's a great farmer's market here uh, in Durham versus the factory farm, which is sort of perceived as you know, what you want to avoid. But if you go to Whole Foods, you can buy organic asparagus that's air shipped in from Chile. Okay, well, it's good, it's organic, but what's the carbon footprint on flying produce? That can't be good. Ultimately, what it comes down to, if you're committed to sustainability, the definition of sustain is to nourish and uphold. But we all operate in a consumer economy, and the definition of consume is to devour and destroy. So we automatically operate in a contradiction. And there's really no way out of the gray. Um, that's the world we live in. How do you be honest about it? How do you share uh, and be transparent about your challenges um, and share with your consumers and other stakeholders the journey that you're on? And that's where we are. And there's no one way to get out of it, but for us, um, some of the ways we do it is to be transparent, to be accountable. We have a, a mission report we put out every year. It's available on our website. I have one copy here I'll leave. Um, but using metrics that people can understand. What's your carbon footprint? Talking about third-party verification. So don't take my word for it that it's organic. Let us rely on the USDA certification process. Don't take my word for it that I tell you we, we you know, work with farms and pay the, the, the pickers well. Let's work with Fair Trade USA to gain third-party verification to make sure that those claims are, ver you know, um, are real. And so that's um, one of the ways to, to get out of the gray um, and give some definition to it. So what has it meant for us to partner with Coca-Cola? Well, the biggest impact has been scale and distribution. So before we partnered with Coke, Honesty was in about 15,000 stores. Today, we're in over 100,000 outlets. I'm delighted that our partners from Coca-Cola, uh, the distributor for Durham and, and, and other areas, and for Duke University, are here in the audience. And, and you know, when I was <laughs> struggling to build the business, I would, we dream of college campuses. We knew this was the right audience for us, but we could never get in, either because we didn't have distribution or because there were contracts that prohibited us. And so we're very proud to be available on campuses like this, um, to reach people who didn't have access to this kind of product before. And to be able to talk about these restaurant chains I mentioned, we never would have had access to those type of opportunities before. So that's how what we do with distribution. What about production? Well, this is a, a real thing. When Barry and I started, we called it honesty because it was brewed with real tea leaves. Most, Bottled tea is brewed with powder or syrup, and they add water, and they call that tea. But we were using real tea leaves, and, and so it was a challenge to make it. Uh, and so Barry, <laughs> I had said, are we going to really be able to make the tea? Um, and Barry said, yeah, what's so hard? You just you know, take a tea bag, but multiply times 10,000, and, and we've got it. Well, as I learned, it's quite, not quite that easy. So we did use these large bags. Um, but the problem was the bags was that you didn't get the full infusion and you'd get explosions and, and we'd end up with like an inch and a half of tea leaves in the bottom of the bottle. People would say, well, am I supposed to eat that or chew that? <laughs> chew that? Um, here's a picture from our first production run, um, early one. This is, these, these are the bags and we dunk them in the tank. And you know, on a good day, we'd get about 18,000 bottles with, with the inch and a half sediment. So we were getting somewhere, but not enough to get scale. And then we evolved to this large tea basket uh, and we got to about 60,000 bottles a day, better, but you know, maybe, a, maybe a, uh, an inch of sediment, but not enough to scale. And so what was going to happen? Well, a lot of the skeptics said, oh, when Coca-Cola buys Honest Tea, they're going to just go to the shortcut, and they're, they're going to get you know, one of these concentrates and, and, and just find a way to make it cheaply. Uh, but instead, we invested uh, in a million dollar, multi-million dollar tea brewing system. So this is our tea brewing system in Northampton, Massachusetts. That's me on the third story. Uh, 500,000 bottles a day. This is our tea brewing system in uh, Sacramento, California, also 500,000 bottles a day. The tea is uh, better clarity, better taste, better consistency than we had in the, in the bad old days, but still made with real tea. So that's what it's meant on the production side. What about on growth and innovation? Well, this is what our growth curve looks like. Um, we hit over 112 million in sales this year, and as you can see, all along the way, for us, is, we call it mission-driven innovation. Our mission is what drives our innovation. So whether it was first to do organic, first to do fair trade, first to expand into new kinds of packaging, um, and each step along the way, um, the mission has helped propel innovation, which helps propel growth. And at the same time, we've had our share of failures. We had a, a bottling plant we owned, which was a disaster. We had a tea bag line. We had a drink called Honest Coca Nova. Anyone here drink that one? That's why it didn't work. So <laughs> we, we had a lot of struggles along the way, too. Um, but all the time, whenever we bring out a new product, how can we take our mission one step further? How can we take it up another notch? And we're still doing that. In fact, 
Um, Co as I said, Coke bought the company in 2011, but it wasn't until, they bought it in uh, March, it wasn't until May of 2011 that all of our teas became fair trade certified. So we've continued our innovation. I'll share with you that um, next month we're going to announce our, our glass line and we're converting over to fair trade sugar. Um, that's something that no one is, uh, that we, we hadn't done before. We use fair trade tea, but not fair trade sugar. So we're continuing to elevate um, our commitment and our mission. So that's how we've grown, but what are some of the ways we've done it? This was a great example. So I will, you know, in the, in the, since we're being honest here, I'll admit that I, I used to make my kids lunches. That my, they, I don't make lunch anymore because they're older. But um, I would put in their lunchbox the, the juice drink, call it that, and it, and it was, uh, in general, Capri Sun. It was a drink, you know, I would basically buy whatever was on sale. And one morning, my son, my middle son said, Dad, I know you sell healthy drinks to grown-ups, but these drinks you put in my lunchbox are really sugary. <laughs> and, and it was 100 calories per pouch, um, which is more sugar per ounce than a can of soda. And um, I, I would willing to guess that a lot of other people here could say the same thing. Um, and I realized, wow, wait a minute, why shouldn't we take the same equities of Honest Tea and put that in a kid's drink? So we created Honest Kids, organic, 40 calories per pouch, and the, and the business has just taken off. This year, or last year now, we said, wait a minute, what if we took out all the sugar and sweetened it only with um, organic white grape juice? Now, nutritionally, it's the same. It's still 40 calories. But when, a cons when the shopper, in this case usually a parent, picks up the product and sees that juice is the first ingredient, that's a lot more uh, exciting. And, and what's amazing about this category, the, what's called aseptic juice kids product, um, is down. It, it, Honest, Honest Kids is up over 30%. Capri Sun's up, uh, down about 20%. Um, and this is more than a third of our business now. Now, getting that much organic OU kosher white grape juice was not easy. We had to, we had to fly rabbis to Turkey uh, and to Argentina. Um, but that's something that we wouldn't have been able to do on our own. Um, so a great example of how we've been able to connect with Coke's you know, capabilities to take a product that was already um, pretty, pretty good and make it even better. What about on other parts of innovation? We uh, brought out larger packages. We just launched a line called Honest Fizz, which is a zero calorie, naturally sweetened soda line, including the first organic zero calorie drink um, that's done extremely well. And, and that's in the natural foods channel primarily. And then this is the, the food service system. This is what we've um, brought to the uh, restaurant chain. So that's a bit about how our innovation has continued to expand. Um, so what about marketing? Well. In the beginning, all we did was sampling. That was basically all we could afford to do. And we go to stores and we give out samples. And that was the way we got the product into people's hands, that they could understand how it's different. And we also were able to build that personal connection. So that worked when we were in a few hundred stores. It even worked when we were in a few thousand stores, because we could get to most of the big stores. But now that we're in a, more than 100,000 stores, it becomes a more challenging proposition. We can't get to every store. But how do we take that same kind of experience and, and make it um, make it something people can interact with. Well, we have our field marketing team, um, and we do all kinds of different events. And, and one of the, the most popular is called our National Honesty Index. So this is a national social experiment we conduct. We set up racks of tea, and we say, pay here a dollar a bottle honor system. And then we just step back and watch the results. We did it in over 50 states uh, last year. And I'm going to share with you the results. But before I do, what's a guess? How, how honest do you think people are? Well, yeah, and then we were doing a little experiment out today. We had, uh, I was signing in the books. The bookstore wasn't here yet. So I said, OK, well, just pay when you get back. I'm willing to bet here that people will pay. But in, in, in a, in a um, you know, downtown area, what percent of people do you think will put a dollar in? There's no one, wa there's no, there's no one visibly watching. There's, you know, I guess today everybody's watching something, right? But you know, there, uh, what, any guess how, how honest people would be? 95. 95, very optimistic. I heard someone else sort of say 60, 70 percent. All right, so I'm going to show you the results. But as I, as I, so you can watch and pay attention to the social experiment, but also think about this as a marketing campaign. This costs us about $350,000 to conduct, and we'll show you the marketing impact, and we can roll the video. are you in public if no one has their eyes on you, or at least you think they don't? America's honesty has been put to the test using data gathered from experiments conducted in all 50 states. The company behind Honest Tea set up an unmanned kiosk all across the states. 
Those kiosks offer drinks for a dollar on the honor system. All while secretly recording. Did you pay a dollar or are you a liar? A <laughs> our company seeks to have this honest and direct relationship with our natural ingredients. And so we always wanted to test how much does the um, American consumer embody those same values? Did you get a tea? No, I didn't. I don't have any cash. And I feel guilty not taking it. <laughs> In some situations, you know, we actually had some people who tried to walk away with a rack of tea just to see, what, you know, if anyone would call them out, and, wow. and no one did. And in some states, your experiment really paid off. Alabama, Hawaii, 100% of the people paid. Isn't that impressive? We track observable characteristics such as male, female, if you have a hat on. <laughs> Someone put a $5 bill in and all they took was one drink. So they said they were extra honest. There's some beauty in the honor system when it works. It really is. The District of Columbia. They were the lowest. <laughs> <laughs> is based uh, very nearby, so I actually um, took the metro in, and then when I got back to the metro, my bike had been stolen. So. <laughs> and you paid! Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Someone else took the tea and then sent you a letter with money inside later yeah. apologizing. Yeah. So obviously yeah. there's remorse out there. Based on the numbers from last year, uh, it was really honest. It was mostly between 90 and 100% honest. And it kind of makes you feel good about society and, you know, the way we're headed. So it was a lot of fun, a fun, interactive way for consumers to sort of understand who we are, to have that experience, and, and frankly, just to give out samples, but you know, um, also support a charity at the same time. All right, I want to try, I, I, I'm mindful of, of our time frame. I want to try to get to questions. Let me give you a few big picture closing thoughts, and then we can have a, a discussion. All right, so, so what is the impact? We've talked about um, what we're doing in health, but what is the impact to our suppliers? Well, when Honest Tea, uh, before Coca-Cola invested, we were buying about 800,000 pounds of organic ingredients uh, before Coke invested. Uh, last year, we bought, we bought over 5 million pounds of organic ingredients. So we're starting to change the way our supplier communities think about, should we be organic or not? Should we be fair trade or not? Um, clearly, we're able to grow the demand, and, and that helps you know, affect the supply. Let me give you two um, big picture closing thoughts. I started talking about China. I'm going to end on, with the same theme. These are, um, or first, just quickly, other ways that we are able to share our impact through the book and through other organizations I've been on the boards of um, that are also finding ways to change, um, whether it's changing diet or um, the way we connect with the environment. But here's two thoughts. Chinese proverb, if we don't change the direction we're headed, we will end up where we're going. It's a truism, right? But where are we going? Well, um, recently, the United Nations ranked the average life expectancy of all um, the countries in the world. There's about 200 countries in the world. And even though the United States is the wealthiest nation in the history of the world, even though we have more advanced knowledge of science and medicine than any other civilization, and even though we spend more on science and medicine than any other civilization, we're not number one or number two. We're number 40. So what does that say about our, our diets, about our lifestyles, about our connection to the natural world, about our connection to each other? we're clearly headed in the wrong direction. And I don't see anything happening that suggests we're changing that direction. And frankly, um, big business is, 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 by definition, invested in that direction. Government, we know, uh, is not very effective at changing things. Nonprofits play an important role. But if we're going to change the direction, it starts, with, it starts with people, and it starts with entrepreneurs who can find different directions and make them viable. You know, if, if um, the Coca-Cola company said, we want to go explore selling a less sweet drink that's organic and fair trade, um, it, that a concept wouldn't have gotten off the ground. It took an entrepreneur to demonstrate it was, could work in the marketplace. And then Coke said, all right, we want to buy into this. And now they're fully committed and selling you know, quite a bit of it. Um, but it, it has, and it, you can take that analogy and apply it to whether it's to automobiles, to, to energy, all of these different ways, 
um, it really takes uh, a different vision to, to, to succeed in the marketplace, and then the big companies will follow. And think about, so I, I talk about the fact that we're 40th when we could be number one, and, and yes, that's a tragedy, but it's also an incredible business opportunity to have the wealthiest nation in the world being able to say, we have the ability, we certainly have the capability to move from 40 to at least the top 10, top five. That's a great business opportunity. But of course, it's not an easy one. And I, one of my favorite scenes in the book is um, I, uh, I was at a family picnic. It was just, uh, just after I launched the company. And uh, I was having a piece of pizza. And I felt something crunchy in my mouth. I said, that's not supposed to be anything hard in pizza. It was my tooth that had cracked. And I went to the dentist. And she said, yeah, no, um, you're grinding your teeth at night. Are you under any stress? I guess, you, I, said, I guess you could say that. All right, well, you got two options. She says, you know, you can try going to sleep and playing, you know, relaxing music and doing yoga before bed. Or I can fit you for a night guard. Your teeth will still grind, but there'll be that padding. And I so I think I'm going to need the night guard. And I, I still wear a night guard because it's still hard work, right? I mean, it was, it's hard to take a, a challenging, challenger business and a, a well-established industry and build a brand. It's challenging to take a mission-driven business and put it into a large corporation and, and build a mission-driven business in a, in a profit-driven world. Um, but it's work that needs to be done. And all along, there were always people who said it couldn't be done. Uh, and I'll close with this proverb. This is on the wall of our office in Bethesda. Those who say it cannot be done should not interrupt the people doing it. <laughs> and, I, and I hope that between this conference and your education here, you'll gain the tools to do it. Um, our world needs you to do it. And, and you can play an amazing role in, in changing the way business interacts with society. So thank you very much for listening. And we're happy to have some questions. <laughs>
barrier we have to get to. Then the next one is price. And so that's another case where scale can make a difference. Um, on the other hand, I can't, you know, I'm not going to lie. Organic is more, I'm not going to lie, but <laughs> that would be bad if I were lying, honestly. Uh, um, organic's more expensive, fair trade's more expensive. Um, what's notable, though, is that our price really hasn't got, as we've, um, as we've kind of increased our, you know, took, taken it up a notch, gone to organic, then gone to fair trade, we've been able to maintain the same price point. So scale does help, um, but it is, ultimately, it is still more expensive. Um, so distribution plays a critical role, and being able to get some scale helps us get our pricing down. The real fact is that most products, um, you know, we have cheap food in the United States. It doesn't really in, uh, incorporate the full cost. It doesn't incorporate the externalities involved in production. Um, and ours, ours incorporates a little more, but um, uh, distribution and scale are two big steps towards democratizing organics. Why don't we bring the mic down here? Where's the mic? Um, thank you. So I, I work with our students here. I'm in the Career Management Center working with our students at Fuqua who are interested in social impact and sustainability. Um, and many of them say, I'd love to do something great, I want to do something good with my career, however, I've got the six-figure debt. Yeah. So what was it that made you decide at that point in your life, like, I'm going to take on this risk yeah. and it's going to be worth it? Because yeah. I know there are many students here saying, I would love to do that, but what about the six-figure debt that I got sitting there? It's a very fair question. And, and um, first of all, there's no perfect time. So, so when we launched Honest Tea, we had... Um, Two sons, and we just, our third son was under a year old, uh, so it was you know, and that's in that sense like not the right time to be betting the house on <laughs> being able to build a business. Um, I took a salary you know that was not an, much less than what an MBA uh, salary could be, but I also was at a point where I recognized, look, even if this thing totally tanks, um, I'm still I'm early enough in my career that um, I've got other opportunities, and and, and it was funny because. You know, I had to resign from Calvert in order to do this. And I remember calling Barry, you know, literally like before I was about to go resign. I said, okay, I'm gonna go leave, you know, I'm gonna go hand in my resignation with this great company to launch this idea. We've never made the product before. And I said, Are you sure? As I said in there, are you sure we can be able to make the tea? And, and Barry said, Well, I'm pretty sure, but I bet you if you um, went to the head of Calvert and said, You wanna go on a sabbatical, I bet you she'd let you do that. And, and she would have, but that, I knew if I was gonna really launch this, I had to go all in. Uh, and so um, you have to, it, it's part of it's, it's a bet. But I think the other thing that's important, and this is my own my own formula for happiness that I got from from one of my Net Impact friends, is you have to think about what what um, really makes you happy. And we were living a we lived in Bethesda, Maryland, so I don't want to you know poor mouth. It was it's a nice community, but we weren't living uh, very fancy. We didn't have any cable or Xbox. I mean, we were living fairly modestly and. What we knew was that um, there's an equation. If what you, what you have uh, is greater than what you want, then you're happy. And so most people assume the way to be happy is to have more. We knew that if we wanted less, we could still be happy. And so, uh, you know, yes, honesty has been financially very successful. And we, we have the ability to have a lot more uh, than we had. But we really haven't changed our lifestyle. We live in the same house. Uh, because we were happy before we launched Honest Tea, and, and we're happy since I launched Honest Tea. So part of it is really understanding what does make you happy, and, and I would say try to keep your overhead low uh, <laughs> before launching. This might be our final question. We'll see how long the answer takes. So <laughs> Sorry, I've been right, right talking in the, on Right it. in the middle up there. Please wait for the mic. It's on its way. So I'm curious to know when and how you made the decision to switch from glass bottling to plastic mm -hmm. and how that affected your business and the honesty of the, the product to the environment. Sure. So first of all, we, we haven't switched. We still sell glass bottles. Uh, we are the top selling bottled tea in the natural foods industry, and that's all with our glass package. And then our PET package, the plastic bottle, is what we sell in the Coca-Cola channel through the national distribution. And there's um, for us, there's a lot of interesting, uh, it's not, when going back into that little areas of gray, it's not as, as obvious as you might think. Everyone assumes glass is, is going to be a more sustainable package because it is 
laterally recyclable, whereas PET is not. But uh, when you look at the carbon uh, footprint of glass, it takes more energy to produce. It's heavier. Um, so we look at environmental efficiency of a package. This, this package, by weight, 10% uh, or not even less, 10% of this is package, 90% is the liquid. With glass, it's 70% uh, liquid, and 30% of the weight is the package. So if all, if all packages were recycled, then glass would be better because you could go into it, but you could keep recycling glass into glass. But the fact is that less than 35% of packages are recycled. So if you have a choice between um, uh, uh, which package you want, if, if we assume that 30% of everything, we, only 30% is reclaimed, and most of it's going to be thrown into landfill, which is unfortunate, I wish it weren't the case, but then you actually want to have a PET package um, that is lighter weight because you're do, it's, you, know, you talk about reduce, reuse, recycle, reduce being the first component, you're just putting less waste by weight into um, the environment, into the, in, you know, back into the environment. Um, so the PET package is a lighter, we, we also can ship, because it's lighter, we can ship 18% more product on a truck, and our freight is actually our largest imprint, so the PET is more environmentally efficient. Um, but what's exciting for us about the future is that Coca-Cola has developed what's called the plant bottle technology. It's a renewable uh, material. It's actually the, the residue after you make sugar cane, and there's an opportunity to make this bottle with at least 30% of it made from uh, renewable plant material and, and for it to be recyclable. So um, I don't have a perfect answer. I can tell you that um, <laughs> we're thinking about it, we're being honest about it. Uh, what we really need to do is increase recycling rates. Uh, and certainly that's something that we've been involved with. We have a campaign called The Great Recycle where we put recycling bins out around the country and, and encourage people to, to recycle. Um, but it, there's, it's imperfect. And this goes to that contradiction. We're, we're committed to sustainability, but we operate in a consumption economy. And it, there's, you know, here are these single-use packages, which we know are not as efficient. Um, one of the interesting things that just happened this, this uh, last week was that Coca-Cola took a 10% stake in Green Mountain Keurig. And so people, um, you know, I guess by the end of this year, will be, have the opportunity to, to make product, a Coca-Cola product at home. Uh, like the Keurig machine, but you could make it uh, your, own, your own. It's like SodaStream, but, but with a Coca-Cola product. And that'll be an interesting uh, evolution for the beverage industry. We're not yet sure what it, what it all means. We know that um, we're exploring the opportunity for honest tea to be used in the Keurig machine as well, um, to brew tea that way. Um, but it is a, this, this, I guess, just a good example of kind of that challenge. Uh, and so, you know, I'd say you, after what I've said, you say, well, how come you're still selling glass if you think PET has as, as many redeeming features. Well, it's a case of what the consumer wants, too. Um, and so certainly the natural foods consumer does value the glass package. Um, but I think it's just one of those cases where there's not a perfect answer. Sorry for the long-winded. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. And for that, we conclude the Q&A portion. Net Impact, we have some SPSI stuff. Oh, nice. And also, oh, wow. Look Gardein's at that. helped us get a Coach K signed back. Very cool. That, that, that's, that's, that's nice. Thank you. Great. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you.